Hello everyone, I'm Neeraj Mulani, the Director of Community at Product 10X. Welcome to the Founder Spotlight series by Product 10X, where we talk with startup founders as we dive deeper into what they're doing, their aspirations behind starting up, the challenges they've faced along the way, and much more. Today, I'm joined by Arindam Nag, co-founder of Sensai, a financial wellness digital platform and a portfolio company of Product 10X. Welcome, Arindam. How are you doing? Very good morning. Thank you very much. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. I'm delighted to have you with us today. I've been following the great work that you've been doing with Sensai over the past few months, and I'm very excited to dig deeper into all of it. I understand that your professional background has given you a strong foundation on which you built your current startup. So I'd like to start off from the beginning. Could you tell us a little bit about your professional background? Sure. So I spent most of my career as a financial journalist, which means telling a story which is based on money, finance, business, but telling a story about people and how they are dealing with their financial lives day to day. And during the 2007, 2008 credit crisis, I actually was writing a column called The Heard on the Street for the Wall Street Journal. And one of my responsibilities was actually sitting in London, explain to the world that if someone is defaulting on a mortgage in Nebraska or California, why is it impacting someone sitting in London or France? Uh, what is going on? At that time, I realized that not only the financial services sector was more global and interconnected than people had appreciated, but something dark was going on, which is there was a deep lack of financial literacy among many Americans who have taken bad financial decisions. They have borrowed money, living their lives through debt. And those debt, because the economy was not in a good shape, uh, people were losing their homes, losing their jobs. They were not able to pay those debt. And that, in effect, triggered the credit crisis. So that led me to believe that, wait a minute, what is the solution? So that's how Sensei was created. I understand that your role as a financial correspondent obviously gave you a different vantage point on how to look at the current scenario of financial literacy. But I'd love to understand what about financial literacy as a sector really intrigued you or made you feel that this is a sector that you would want to disturb. Yeah, and it's a very good question. If you look at the history of the human society, we've been a very problem-solving group. If you look at all the animals, the human race is probably the most sophisticated when it comes to solving problems. And we sometimes suffer deeply before even taking the problem by the scruff of its neck. And we are living at a stage where today, whether it is the inflation going around in the world, whether it is the hubris created by certain cryptocurrencies, we are living at a stage where you cannot escape financial illiteracy anymore. And what has intrigued me is that, especially in America at least, personal finance or financial education has never been part and parcel of one's upbringing. So when I started Sensei, only 17 states out of 50, which is less than 50%, had made it compulsory to provide personal finance in middle schools and high schools. So imagine you're asking for your parents for pocket money. You are taking money, you're buying stuff, you're going to people's birthday parties, spending money, but you actually don't know how that money works, where the money comes from. And the whole ability to respect wealth, that should start from when you're a kid. But you need to have a system that supports that. And America, even today, we don't have that system. So Sensei, again, is playing a role by which, okay, let's work with the millennials, let's work with the younger generation X, let's work with the baby boomers and help them manage their money so that they can live a better life or at least not face a personal financial crisis. And I'd love to obviously dig deeper into the great work that you're doing with Sensei. For the benefit of our viewers, I'd love to touch upon your previous startup as well, Finlet, because that's also a financial literacy startup that you worked on briefly before 
then setting up sense sites i'd love to understand how that came about and what sort of learnings did you take from that startup on to sense site yes it's a good question and i honestly 10 years ago someone had told me that you'd be running your own business one day i would have just laughed him off and i think i did laugh when people suggested hey why aren't you launching your own business when i was work, still working as a journalist this woman who sadly has passed away she was ahead of the game and this woman her name was she's a late uh, holly pressman she came from a family of money and she wanted to give back she was a philanthropist and she created this financial literacy website but she needed some help with content so she reached out to me pretty much uh, out of the cold and said hey look can we talk so that's how i got introduced to the startup world my, my view even till then was oh startups are for silicon valley you need a lot of money and it's basically uh, you live hands to mouth for 10 years but as I learned her business, I realized that, wait a minute, there's actually a big gap in the industry. If you can understand the problem and if you can get a grip over the solution that you want to create, you could potentially build a product and then take the product to a corporation stage. That's how you know, my experience with this particular startup, sadly, the woman passed away and the company folded, but I was able to pick up my knowledge and experience and start up on my own. And you touched upon something interesting, Arindam, uh, where from outside looking in, you always thought that you may not want to turn an entrepreneur, but yeah. when you got into it, you realize that this is something that really interests and intrigues you. I'd love to understand at what point did that switch happen for you? Was it something gradual or is it on like, that one fortuitous moment where you realize, okay, this is something that I'd want to do? Well, I, think that, I think this can be segmented into three phases, right? Like when, you, when you're trying to work on a product, you're actually trying to work on the problem and understanding the problem first. And I have written about businesses long enough to know that if you don't really learn about the problem of people, the solution is always half-baked and you'll fail because someone else will come in with a better product, with a better awareness of the problems and you are left behind. I didn't want that to happen. So me and my co-founder, Doria, we actually spend a lot of time in understanding what the real problem is. And the real problem actually is engagement. Financial services firms, they, even today, they struggle with engagement. I was on a call with a prospect last week and the CEO of this bank said, look, we know that we are using one of the biggest financial education companies content, but we don't see any more engagement. There's a drop off, like there's a 50% drop off every time someone does a course. And they're coming to us because we, are more engaging. We actually are able to using gamification, using storytelling, and using a couple of other points that is increasing engagement among users. And that is what the financial services sector was missing. Finance is something that people on Wall Street or people with a CFA or an MBA, they have woven this myth that finance is complicated, finance is tough, finance is for, is for smart people only. But that is not the truth. The truth is that if it is taught the right way, it is understandable, it is digestible, it can be engaging. There is an old saying that, oh, I was bad in maths in, in grade five. No, you were not bad in maths in grade five, you just had a bad maths teacher in grade five. So we focused on the teaching, we focused on the engagement, and it took us a long time. It took us almost four years to actually come up with a product that financial services firms and schools were actually say, wait a minute, no, you guys have something different. Let's talk. All right. Yeah. And I think I was also going to touch upon the, the same myth as I was bad at math because there is money to be made if you make somebody else feel that they're not good at something. And that's how the... A lot of industries have functioned, but kudos to you for empowering people to believe that this is something that is under their control and not something that they need to always outsource. Yeah. And like you touched upon, you had to spend a good number of years to build that product that was engaging the users and also customers. How do you find 
perspective throughout those four years to keep keep at it because four years obviously is a good amount of time where you would have faced various different kinds of challenges along those lines but how do you keep that perspective that this is something that is going to add value to the ecosystem and you must keep at it i think it's a question of two things one is you don't work in a bubble and while it is very easy to get trapped into a bubble because you focus on the product etc but the point is in the meantime your competitors are coming out and coming up with better products and i'll give you an example so 10 years ago the fintech sector 10 12 years ago the fintech sector came up and everyone pretty much wanted to build the next big thing when it comes to digital banking teenage banking ac- accessing millennials Today, we are looking at least 100 apps that do the same thing. It's because, not because each one of them thought that they were better than others. At some point of time, each one of them thought that they were the only ones doing it because they were not looking outside outside the marketplace. So today, we are stuck with uh, hundreds of apps, and some of them are unique, but the majority of them are not, and many of them will collapse. Some of them are differentiating themselves by providing good financial education and content, and they're coming to us. We are partnering with them. Now, the only way you keep perspective for a prolonged period of time and continue to succeed, and we are nowhere, we cannot declare ourselves successful yet. We are probably still years away from that. But one thing that I've learned is that you have to take into account what's going on outside your room. Is the competition, your peers, what are people doing who are established players? The established players, they don't stand still. They also innovate. I mean, people keep talking about, oh, the big banks are stodgy. In the meantime, Goldman Sachs has bought Marcus and has converted it to one of the best performing digital banking platforms in the whole country. Chase Bank is putting financial literacy on their homepage. Chase Bank never did that. So people are waking up to the needs of easy use of banking, financial education, connecting with the public. People are doing that. And obviously that brings that reiteration to that you are working towards something that is going to be of a a lot of value. And going back to those four years of building the product and you've been running Zensai now for more than six years, could you tell us a little bit more about what were those early days like of building the product and what sort of challenges came your way? How did you overcome them? Yeah, I think the, the most important problem that you always face is finding your co-founders. And I knew pretty early on that I needed, my product will be of two, two pieces. One is a content side, and second, technology. And I was very lucky that my co-founder, Doria, she comes from a very good, strong content background. She came from the content background that is meant for millennials, young people, and non-financial. So she was able to combine her skills with my financial skills. So I spent most of my life writing for Wall Street people who understood finance. So it was a good combination. But then the third piece, my third co-founder, Sandeep, he came from a technology background and he knew exactly what needed to be done to build a website, having a front-end developer, having a back-end developer. He built a team, all four team members, they're based in India. They've been with the company for the last five years. And This continuity is rare in a startup, and I'm very lucky to have a co-founder in India who's been able to hold on to this team, who knows our product inside out. Now, the next big challenge is to grow from there, help the team grow. So we've started talking to people or interacting with people other parts of the world with various other technological skills, bringing them together and seeing the product grow. I think it's quite fair to see you know, startups being able to hold on to their team because the attrition is generally so high. What would you attribute that to, especially because it is important for the founders to set that kind of culture and also bring a lot of value to the employees so that they feel secure enough in the job? 
I think you have to be transparent with your team members. Look, we are nowhere, we are not there yet in terms of huge amounts of cash flow, large salaries, et cetera. For us, it has been a grind in getting the product into the marketplace, getting it validated. Financial education is also something that a lot of people pay lip service, but when it comes to real action and integrating financial education, people don't know where to start. So even though you may have a good product, which is appropriately priced, people don't know at what stage in their strategy they should embrace a product like Sensei in the ecosystem. But people are getting there. We are getting more meetings. Our pipeline is building very strongly. And as long as you are communicating that to your team members, compensating them, equally with equity and options and everything along with the cash salaries and let them know the vision you can actually hold on to a good team and throughout these years of building the team building the product building the pipeline of the customers you also somewhere along the line you decided to join hands with product 10x i'm curious to know what made you choose p10x as a partner to help you on your journey yeah so we created this massive content library and we have one of the world's largest financial education content libraries in two languages english and spanish and i knew fairly quickly around two and a half years ago that just having a consumer facing platform wasn't enough i wanted to meet people where they are and people are in schools people are in the workplace people are on a banking website, on an advisor website. So how can I reach them? So I needed a B2B product. And that's when we started looking at creating Sensei One. And our internal team run by Sandeep, they also came up with a smart technology that actually helps any user to convert a piece of content into a lead generation solution. So it was almost like a carrot to say, hey, listen, if you take our content, if you take our library, it'll improve your engagement with your customers. But at the same time, you will be able to get leads and customers back to your website. So I needed someone to own that product piece. And that was the time when Product NX came, serendipity that the Product NX general partners, uh, one of them being Jogi, and we started interacting and then he introduced me to Suresh. And it was a long, we had some series of conversations till I realized that he is the right person and the right team who understood what we do. Getting talented people is not that hard, but getting people to believe in your mission is not easy. I want people who wake up in the morning and are working for Sensei to believe that access to financial literacy is a human right. And that's what we live for. That's what gets me up in the morning. And I want everyone around me to believe that. And Suresh is one of them. And it's been a very fruitful relationship so far. And what would you say has been the biggest contribution of P10X to your journey as a founder of Sensei? So I will start off by saying, I think, I think the best is yet to come as always in any, in all relationships. I think product 10X has learned over time how, and they're still learning and we are working together. We are learning together how the landscape works, how the user experience works, the whole process of putting together a structure. We recently acquired a company, uh, a gamification company. And I have to say product 10X has been on the ball from day one, we didn't really spend time much in trying to explain why we are doing the acquisition. Product 10X team knows the value of gamification. They immediately put together, okay, financial education, and it's a good combination. Let's do this. So in the last few weeks, I've been very impressed by the way Product 10X has owned the integration of of this M&A. This is our first mergers and acquisition, so to speak hopefully one of many to come. And it's been a good symbiotic relationship for both of us. <laughs> yeah, I'm very glad to hear that. And in, in terms of the challenges that you have faced over the, the past six, six and a half years of building Sensei, I personally always believe challenges are only opportunities to learn more about the company and about yourself as a founder. 
So what would you say are some of your biggest learnings throughout this journey? I think for me, the, one of the biggest learnings have been, you have to be very careful about people. I think the mantra is, if you have the good people on the team, treat them well and ensure that they are performing well. But in, in your startup journey, you also meet a lot of not so good people. And my struggle initially has been giving a lot of people, or some people at least, a long rope to hang themselves. And I realized over time that I have to shorten the length of the rope now. Because otherwise, if you're not a fit for each other, we need to have the conversation. Many people will come to you that they can, promising you the moon and the earth. But then when it comes to rolling your sleeves and doing the job, you realize, no, it's not really that easy. And then you have to have the tough conversation. And for me, that has been difficult. I have been a manager before in my previous lives, but I've always inherited a team or had support from other colleagues who helped me in the recruitment process. When you're a startup, you're pretty much recruiting your team on your own and you make mistakes. And I think that's something that we need to get better at and I'm getting better at. I am more cautious about recruiting people these days. And that's something that I'm learning as we go. Yeah, I think these sort of learnings and reflections obviously set the founder as well as the company up for success. And that sort of brings me to the next question, which is, what does success look like to you for yourself as a founder and for your company sense? Yeah, so it's a good question. We do want to become the number one financial education partner for the financial services sector, for academic institutions and for the workplace. Because financial education in some levels are different from country to country. But when it comes to some basic financial principles, which is learning how to budget, learning how to save, how does the stock market work? And I want every single citizen in the world to have access to high quality financial education. And I want Sensei to be that company in multi-languages. So we have a target of reaching a billion people or actually two billion people by 2028, and which means I need to partner with several partners in several countries. Our immediate goals are establish our footing in America, Latin America, and then get into markets in India, where people are working, but they may not have enough financial education. And how do you make that engaging? So that's, I would say, if I can achieve that, I would say that sense would be a success. I think that's a great goal to have for your organization, for yourself. And I know that you guys are certainly on your way. There, there has been great ability around the startup. There have been great strides being made towards that goal. And I'd love to close out with a question that I believe will really help our community members. So what is your advice to aspiring entrepreneurs? I think... The biggest advice I would give is understand the problem you're trying to solve. No problem is really dimensional. And understand the problem from multiple angles. Then creating the solution becomes easy. For us, it wasn't just a case of creating another content platform. We actually genuinely we focused on one problem, which is lack of engagement. And our future growth of the company will actually be embracing new technologies that combines with content and magnifies engagement with the content. So if any entrepreneur wants to set up a business or build a business, focus on the problem, get your product tested, get enough feedback, and then you plan your scale up. Otherwise you end up scaling up a half baked product and you can be outwitted by more cash rich competitors who will take your idea build on it further and throw you out of the marketplace. Yeah, I think that's quality advice for aspiring entrepreneurs and I'm sure the community would really appreciate that. So thank you for that and thank you so much for taking out the time today Arindam, and sharing your insights so generously with us. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be on this session and I wish you all the best as well. Thank you. Cheers.